welcome uh, to this Upgrade Your Sound product showcase. My name is Steve Selman with Music and Arts. Um, as a trumpet player myself, I'm really excited to spend some time talking about Bach trumpets. Um, got a couple of very special guests joining us from Con Summer Company, Mr. Jeremy Mueller and Mr. Jason Smith. Uh, they are here to discuss a couple of the key models and share some insights into what makes Bach trumpets unique. And of course, answer any questions that might come up during their presentation. Uh, you can see there's some Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. So at any point during this session, you can post a question and somebody will be able to answer it for you. Um, I'd love to hear from you. And, and obviously I'll pose those questions so that we can hear some discussion around that from our um, expert panelists. Bach trumpets are incredibly popular among students and teachers. I, I personally have played a, a Bach B flat trumpet for the last 25 years. Um, we're gonna take a deep dive on three particular models and hear from these experts why Bach is a great choice for the advancing trumpet player looking to upgrade to a better instrument. Um, you know, upgrading your instrument, upgrading your horn makes an incredible difference in the enjoyment of playing and really unlocks the true potential of, of what kind of trumpet player that you can be. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our experts in this field. So welcome to Jeremy, welcome to Jason, um, and take it away. Thanks so much, Steve. Um, good afternoon. Good evening. Wow. Um, first of all, thank you, Steve, for that amazing intro music that was beyond inspiring and definitely set the tone. Uh, it's really amazing to be here. You know, I've had the opportunity to participate in so many different Upgrade Your Sound uh, events for music and arts really over the last two decades. Um, but I never imagined that we'd all be sitting here quite like this, like in the Zoom format. So. You know, I guess I have to first thank you, Steve, and the music and arts team and the Woodwind and Brassman teams for just putting this thing together for your dedication to keeping music playing during this beyond interesting year. Uh, definitely have to thank my colleague um, and welcome Jason Smith. He's our brass category and product manager. Uh, thank you for joining us here today as well. And frankly, I'd like to kind of thank you all out here in the Zoom world for joining today, spending part of your afternoon, evening with us, talking about step up and pro trumpets. I don't think that there's anything that I want to do more than do that. And, um, you know, I think at least for me, the single most rewarding thing for all of us on this side of the industry is getting that opportunity to talk about moving into a step up or into a professional level instrument, especially for students, you know, that process of finding the right fit and the sound discovery, it's a major step in their journey. And it's, you know, one of the most, at least for me, one of the most humbling and, and really incredible parts of the musical retail world. So thank you all so much for just letting us be even a small part of it. And I guess I'd like to start off by introducing us and then telling you a little bit more about who Con Summer is as a company. So next slide, Steve. Um, there we are. Uh, my name is Jeremy Mueller. As Steve had mentioned, I'm uh, one of the regional directors of sales for Con Selmer, and I have the privilege and honor of managing both the music and arts and the woodwind accounts. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is Jason Smith with us as well today. He's our brass product manager. And so who is Con Selmer? Who are we? And as you can see from the bottom of the, the slide here, that one of the really special and unique aspects of Con Summer and kind of our DNA is that we are an entire family of brands. You know, unlike most companies that represent one or maybe two, Con Summer represents many. You can see down here Armstrong, Bach, Con, Holton, King, LeBlanc, Ludwig, Musser, Sherlin Roth, Selmer, Selmer Paris, and even Yanagasawa. You know, that family of brands has been growing over a hundred years and really represents a full history lesson in the modern band and orchestral manufacturing world. And we are the only true American made manufacturer of band instruments. And we're extremely proud of that too. Uh, we have facilities in East Lake, Ohio. That's where most of our uh, student and low brass products made. We 
have a flagship location in Elkhart, Indiana, where uh, our pro brass is made. And that's really what we're going to be talking about here today. Uh, and we also have a facility just outside of Charlotte in Monroe, North Carolina. Uh, and that's our Ludwig factory. So even with this many brands, um, there is one common denominator, one sort of um, just for lack of a better word, a, a resonant piece. It's a, a major thread that kind of runs through all of them. And that's the concept of sound and sound quality. You know, with each, within each one of those brands that's listed down below there is this iconic sound. And it's often studied. Uh, in many cases, it's copied or someone tries to copy it uh, because it stands as the beacon and the pinnacle of what that instrument should sound like. So for example, the Selmer Paris Mark VI saxophone is kind of universally revered as the most iconic sax of all time ever made. Uh, and maybe even more appropriate, another example uh, for today's discussion is Bach brass. It has an iconic sound that has absolutely just defined the modern orchestra for decades. Uh, and there's a a lot of secret sauce that kind of goes into creating that from a material standpoint, from a manufacturing standpoint. And Jason's gonna talk a little bit about that in some more detail a little later. Next slide, Steve. But at the end of the day, it's really not about who we are. It's really about you, the folks of you on on this Zoom call today. You know, upgrading your sound is such an important part of the musical journey. And, you know, I use that phrase a lot. I've already used it a few times here today, the musical journey. And it involves a lot of different and important people. And I think most of you are on the call today. You know, some of you on the line are likely band directors or teachers of some sort, private instructors. And your role is supporting your students. And it's likely that you've identified that they are kind of ready for that next step. You know, many of you on the call today are likely parents. Uh, for you, you have a tough job. You know, you've got to weigh the interest layer, uh, interest um, level of the player. You have to weigh intent, uh, of course, budget, support. And it can be a really tricky balance, especially when there are so many different options out there. Um, I'm sure we have many students on the line here today as well. And, you know, this session is ultimately for you. You know, this is an incredibly exciting time. Uh, upgrading your instrument is so exciting, but, you know, this year has been challenging for so many different band and orchestra programs. And I'm sure you've all experienced that, but, you know, through all of it, one thing that I have definitely learned is that music survives. And it survives because it's just built on this unbelievable foundation and platform of passion and dedication and personal expression and camaraderie, friendship, commitment. You know, all of these are major concepts that, that fall into this platform and foundation. And those things, I think, create an impenetrable just army of musicians that continue to grow, they continue to thrive in really any environment. And then lastly, we probably also have some Bach enthusiasts on, on here too. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, Bach brass has defined the iconic trumpet sound in the modern era. And it's the most widely accepted brand in trumpets. And, and hopefully today we can kind of show you all why. Next slide, Steve. So in a bit, um, Jason's going to talk through some of our iconic trumpets, but before he does, I wanted to just talk you through some of the things um, to consider as you're getting ready to invest in a new instrument. And I think really the first thing to discuss is just generally defining what a step up really is and why is it a, a critical part of the musical journey. You know, on this slide, I've listed, I think, the four main points that differentiate an upgraded model over a typical student level. So upgraded instruments are going to have improved sound quality. They're going to be made with superior materials. Um, there is a more kind of artisanal design and manufacturing technique that's used as well. Then all of that kind of rolls up 
into an instrument that's then going to have superior playability. And I think all of these things are critical components that aid students as they progress. And it's really important that the, the tools that you use match the direction that you're going. You know, every type of instrument is built to serve a certain purpose, right? And at the student and beginner level, which I'm sure a lot of you are currently, you know, using an instrument like that at that beginner level, our instruments are designed to produce a basic sound with minimal effort, right? Since many of the players are gonna be inexperienced, they're making the first note, they're playing their first scale and it needs to be built uh, for some easy, easy access there. They're also designed to really withstand a, a beating. You know, kids are just starting to learn how to hold it, clean it properly. They're gonna to clank together in the band room. They're likely gonna fall off the lap on the floor. Uh, cases are gonna get dropped. So they're built for that durability and they're built for that basic quality function. But as you upgrade, it's assumed then that all of those basic levels of understanding and foundation are already in place, right? So now the main function of an upgraded instrument is gonna to be to produce a far superior tone, better dexterity, more consistency throughout all the ranges of the instrument. You know, as you progress, the music gets harder, it gets higher, it gets lower, it gets faster. And so even if a player is not ready to take full advantage of all those aspects yet in their playing, it's really important to be working on or with a tool that's going to be able to provide that. And, you know, when I think about that concept, it, it reminds me, I kind of liken it a bit to my own experience playing golf, just to give you a non-musical example. You know, I am a very amateur golfer. Um, Steve can actually probably attest to that. Um, but quasi recently I bought my first set of real golf clubs and it was a really special moment for me I did a ton of research on it, um, it they are a very large investment um, and naively you know I, I purchased these golf clubs thinking that as soon as I put them in my hand I'm going to become the next Tiger Woods and and that actually was my my real life experience with that was that it couldn't be further from the truth actually that my first round of golf playing with these new fantastic clubs I didn't even shoot my lowest score, but what I've learned is that I, you know, I've now been able to improve my game in ways that I never would have been able to before if I hadn't had those. So in a nutshell, it's important to remember that these instruments are tools and upgrading your inventory, your tool is really important part of the process of learning an instrument. Next step. Um, so I guess the, the next big question, and I think the last thing that I'm going to talk about before I turn it over to Jason is just ensuring that you know how to make the right choice. Like what are the factors to consider? How do you set yourself up for success? You know, instruments for sure are an investment and there's generally a lot of options out there. But if you focus on these five core things that I put on the slide here, I'm sure that you're going to make a great decision. So the first one, is player readiness. You know, there is no real set age for when someone should step up. You know, I've had the honor of working with literally, I guess at this point, hundreds of families over the years through this process. Uh, and I've been asked that question just absolutely dozens and dozens of times of, you know, how old is the right age to step up? And really for me, the answer is, less about age and it's much more about what the player's goals are what the commitment level is you know if your player is interested in uh playing into and through high school um uh then it would really serve you well to to step up you know if they're an all state or a first chair type of a person uh then it's likely i'd say critical to step up uh the second is making sure to choose an instrument and a manufacturer that's reputable. You know, that should narrow your decision, I think, way down. You know, I strongly suggest that if you're making an investment in a new instrument, you target only those manufacturers that have a strong history of iconic sound and, and manufacturing excellence. And the teams at Music and Arts and Woodwind uh, can really help there, kind of guide you if you have any questions about that. Um, third, it's always a great idea to get educator endorsement. As I mentioned, we probably have a bunch of um, educators on the line here today, but private teachers, professors, band directors, we all have them, right? They're all part of our musical lives and they are true pros. 
and they know the best brands. They know even what models would be a good choice or a good fit for your player. Um, fourth is making sure that you do a little research on your own about build specifications and performance capabilities. And there really are quite a few differences in the construction from one instrument to the next. You know, on this slide here, we have two of our um, our trumpets. The one on the left, we're actually going to be talking about it uh, about it a little bit later. It's a box Stradivarius trumpet, professional level trumpet. And the one on the right is a student model. And obviously they have a different finish, but other than that, they actually look fairly, um, you know, similarly, but um, there really are quite a few differences in that construction from one to the next. Things like bell material, uh, silver plating versus lacquer, one piece hand hammered bell versus a seamless two piece bell, bore sizes, bracing placement and style, um, slide styles and materials, lead pipes. The list is like almost endless. And each one of those things makes a huge difference in the tone and the playability. And that can seem like a lot of info to really understand. And the truth is it can be, but to make it easier, you know, I would work in partnership with the music and arts team and with the woodwind team to kind of help discover which specs uh, best fit what type of player. They can really assist there. And definitely remember that the con summer uh, team, like the product managers, the DM team, we're also here to assist you in any way possible as well. Uh, and then lastly is the feel and sound. And I think that that's really the exciting part, right? Like it's so exciting to play a step up in a pro instrument for the first time, especially if you're a student. And uh, the retail stores at Music and Arts can really help guide you through the trial process. But the bottom line, and my general rule of thumb is that if it feels right, if it sounds right, then it probably is right, right? Uh, and I know that it has definitely been a funky year for sure for educational music, but um, please, even with some programs completely down or most problems, uh, uh, programs at least being somewhat modified, I would definitely consider investing in an upgraded instrument, especially this year, especially in this environment, because it's so important that we as parents, uh, we as educators continue to support those that are playing. We need, it's our job now to really find opportunities to inspire them. And new gear is definitely one of those things. It's so exciting to get a new instrument and it can um, reestablish that bond with playing and can kind of continue to keep things moving forward. So with that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason and he's gonna walk you all through a few of our absolutely iconic models. And I hope that you're gonna see as he's going through that, that each one of these models really checks every single box um, of what the right type of instrument should look like, what it should feel like, and what it should sound like. So each one of these instruments would be an absolutely fabulous choice. So thanks, I'm gonna turn it over to Jason. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Um, and thank you, Steve. Thank you to the Music and Arts team. You know, we're really thrilled to have a chance to be here this evening uh, to spend some time with you all. And, and thank you all, the uh, participants, for joining us. Uh, I know it's it's a different world, and uh, having this virtual experience isn't the same as you know going to um, a real event. But you know, it's it's important to get information. It's important to get the right information because there's a lot of 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 clutter on the internet. You know, you can go out there and do a lot of research on your own, but but getting things straight from the source is really important. So tonight we're really going to dive into some some key uh, aspects of what makes the Bach trumpet such a special instrument. And we're going to talk about the sound first and foremost and, and what sets that apart from every other trumpet out there. Let's go ahead and jump into the first slide here. So Jeremy mentioned this, that all of our brands and all of our, our instruments within those brands and this family are really rooted into um, setting the bar for the sound that is expected across the entire globe. You know, the, the sound of a Bach trumpet is, is such a unique thing. And what sets it apart 
is that the, the quality of sound, and we could talk a little bit about that. You see these two pictures here. You know, of course, the one on the left of your screen is, is in black and white, the one on the right is, is in color. But that color brings out this vibrancy that, that just pulls you in. It, it almost adds more dimension to the picture, right? Um, and it just, it makes you feel like you're in that moment. It, it just elevates the level and the awareness of what you're seeing. The same thing is true with the sound of an instrument. It's, it's about not what you see, but what you hear. And when you hear a, an instrument that has a, an amazing sound, it encompasses the full spectrum of color. And when I say color, when it comes to sound, it's, it's not like reds and blues and yellows and greens. It's, it's more about the, the frequencies of sound and the way that those balance out with each other. You know, we have a lot of variation in frequency from very low sounds to middle range and up and high range and, and up, of course, much higher than I, I want to demonstrate. But, you know, that full color spectrum is what, what can identify uh, what we might label as something as um, a dark sound or bright or brilliant sound, something that, that can project easier or blend easier or be very balanced. The thing that makes Bach special is that you're able to capture a very wide spectrum of sound. It's not a narrow palette of color. Like a painter has a palette full of colors to paint with. You know, Bach trumpet is like this huge assortment of colors and, and you're not limited in any way to explore the sound of different colors, regardless of how soft or loud you play or how high or low you play. It really enables an artist or a student to explore the tone that they're after and to really help them progress and, and find the sound that they want in their head, you know? And that's, that's the key to, to getting better as a musician is having a sound in your head, listening to artists and, and really trying to capture that. And that's the beauty of a Bach trumpet is, is it enables you to do that. So how do we get that sound? What makes Bach so different? You know, there's some really key uh, essential ingredients to that secret recipe. And, you know, one of the great things is first and foremost, the material we start with, you know, all of our brass is what we call virgin brass. So we never use anything that's recycled material or reprocessed. It's, it's sole intention in life is to become a trumpet. And, and we take a lot of pride in that, that, you know, it's really a, a, um, an important factor into creating the sound. And uh, the really important step after that is what we do in the process of forming that flat sheet of brass into a bell. And that's what's so unique about Bach bells is the fact that they are one piece bells. So just for a quick example here, I'll show you this trumpet. If you look at the bell section itself, you know, the bell comes from the tip all the way around and it actually continues to bend into the, the valve block here. So this is actually, before we bend, this is one long piece coming up. That's all one flat sheet of brass that is formed into the bell. And a lot of people use two piece bells, which is actually split right in this area in here. So this whole section is one piece and then the flare is a second piece and then they can fuse that together with various methods. And we do make some, some trumpets like that, especially in our student line. Um, but all of our professional box drive various models uh, have a one piece bell construction. And what that does for the sound is it enables the, the vibration to continuously flow from a longer period of point. And, and it really helps to enhance the sound quality and, and the, the overall resonance or the vibration, right? So the really important step to take that even further is some of the really special processes we do. Uh, it's called annealing. Now annealing is basically applying heat to metals. So when you apply heat to metal, it, it kind of changes the molecular structure. We don't have to get all scientific about it, but it allows us to really work the metal and the brass into the shape we want. And it, it allows it to form very naturally. So we do this heating process, the annealing process in a very, very unique way. And this is a way that was established 
many years ago. I mean, we're talking almost a hundred years that this process has been really solidified by Vincent Bach, who obviously is the, the founder of Bach Trumpets. And he did countless, countless hours of research identifying the proper temperatures and the proper times to get the greatest combination to create the most amazing sound quality he could. And this, this heating process happens at various points throughout the manufacturing of the bell. And what we're gonna do now is take a quick look at a video just to show you some of the steps that are involved in making a bell. And it's, it's really special because, you know, I really have to highlight the fact that everything we make is all handmade. You know, our bells don't come out of a machine. You know, the, the only thing that is in a machine process is what we call hydroforming is where we kind of puff out the brass and get a little bit of this, this flared out shape. And you'll see some of that in these weird looking bells. It's, it's a flat sheet and all of a sudden it's puffed out at the end. And then we cut that out and then we put it together and we have a seam that comes and, and we braise that seam together. And then we start to really get the shape formed out by hammering it. And there's that heating process at various points. So there's so many steps. This is a, this is a, a pretty big collection of steps. And it really is, is a small part of the whole process because there's over 200 steps involved in making a Bach trumpet. So let's take a look at some of these steps in, in our bell manufacturing. So that gave you a really cool look at uh, inside the factory. And uh, it's it's really an amazing process. I love going into the, the bell manufacturing area and watching these skilled artisans craft this beautiful shape. You know, this is such a, a cool thing. You look at this like, wow, this is, how does that become a trumpet? You know, it's just a, a flat sheet of brass. It's really amazing. And, and how do you get that sound out of there? So you can see that there's there's a lot of steps in that process there that take us to that. And there's more beyond that where it comes to bell spinning and it's spinning around in a mandrel and they use a, a, a wooden rod to, to really smooth it out and get that nice curved finish. So a lot goes into just the bell itself. You know, and of course, there's a lot of other aspects involved in the trumpet, but that that bell is is such an integral part of the sound quality that is so unique to Bach. So let's go ahead and move on now, and we're going to dive into a, a couple of these key models, and and what makes the 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 true identity uh, of each model different from each other. You know, when you look at these three trumpets, you're like, wow, these are like exactly the same trumpet. Well, yeah, <laughs> they really look the same. <clears throat> then there's very little bit that you can see from a visual uh, perspective from far away. As you look closer, there's there's some differences. But we're going to go through these uh, three things here. The, the, the main flagship model is the 180. Um, you know, that is the quintessential Bach trumpet. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll go through uh, uh, two options of that, and then we'll talk a little bit about the 190 series. So let's go ahead and jump into the next slide and, and talk about this 180 S37. Uh, this is the number one selling professional trumpet of all time. You know, this, this more people have bought and played uh, a 180 S37 than any other trumpet in the world. Um, and it's you know, partially because it's been around for so long, um, but also because it's maintained its status as the greatest trumpet on the planet. You know, it really plays like no other trumpet. And it's it's the most 
often copied trumpet model there is out there. Um, now we we have a phrase that says uh, often copied but never duplicated, because a lot of people really have tried to 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 copy you know the shape of the bell um, and the design of the pistons. You know the materials we use. They try to do as, as much as they can the, the lead pipes, the receivers here, but but. As I mentioned before, there's so many little uh, parts of that secret recipe that we put into the design of this and, and the, the processes of manufacturing that, that allow us to really uh, keep it a secret, yes, but also keep it elevated in the way it plays. So I, I talked a lot about the bell construction. Now, you look at the model number, 180S37. That those last two numbers, the 37 is referring to the bell itself. It's a 37 bell. And what that means, that's actually the, the, the number of the bell mandrel. The mandrel is the thing that you put inside the bell when you spin it around and get that exact shape you want of it. And uh, there's different mandrels, different sizes. Uh, what they are are different tapers, the rate it expands. Uh, a little bit different flares. And, and, and the number 37 was exactly the 37th mandrel that Bach had experimented with. And he landed on this number and it, it was just, you know, pure gold. And that's that's been the staple. You know, you see about yeah, maybe 85, 90% of trumpet players prefer the 37 bell. And we'll talk a little bit later uh, briefly about some of the other bell options we have. But but that is that is the quintessential Bach bells, the 37 bell. It just produces such a warm sound and great, great pr projection. Uh, the other components to go into this is, is the lead pipe. You know, we'll talk a little bit about various options, especially in the next model uh, that you can explore on lead pipes. But that 25 lead pipe is, is the standard Bach lead pipe. It's really the great place to start. If you're looking to get into a, a stepping up to another level trumpet, you know, this is kind of like home base. This is where so many of the world's greatest trumpet players have started their careers. And, and later you can explore different options down the road. Uh, it is a medium large bore uh, instrument, 459. And just a quick tech note for a lot of people where we measure, that's actually measured uh, by where the second valve comes out here. It's the inside diameter of that tube as you're blowing through it. So you get a little bit bigger bore size is more airflow, a little bit more smaller bore is, is less of a narrow airflow. And then of course the S in here, the 180S37 is for the silver plated finish. Uh, it really just gives a, a lot of brilliance to the sound and it's, it's become a pretty standard option. Uh, as far as trumpet players are concerned. So again, the 180S37, this is the, uh, the flagship model. It's, it's, it's home for so many great trumpet players all over the, ro the world. So uh, let's hey, go Jason. ahead and move on. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Really, really sorry to interrupt you. Uh, a great question came in. Um, and, you know, before I get to that question, I mean, this is the horn that I started on. Um, you know, I know that there are a lot of parents out there that that go back and forth and, you know, you, you look at all the different numbers and you look at the, all the different options and it can be a little bit overwhelming for, you know, beginner trumpet player, intermediate trumpet player to try to figure out what's the best horn for them. Um, and, you know, I guess the advice that I would give is, uh, you know, there's no reason that you can't modify that instrument down the road. And I know that you touched on that, but, you know, this is what I started with whenever I was in the eighth grade. Uh, and it's a, a good segue into the question that came up, which is, you know, is this a good instrument for marching band? Um, I'll leave it to you to answer that, but, um, you know, that's, uh, that's a commonly asked thing. You're moving into high school, marching band is going to be a, a concept that you're going to have to deal with. Is that something, is this something that you would recommend for marching band? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, the, the 180 is definitely a great horn for a variety of, of styles and, and settings. You know, you can play this in, in concert band, you can play this in the orchestra, you can play it in jazz band. Uh, a lot of people use it for, for small group settings or commercial playing, you know, pop, anything really. It's very versatile and absolutely on the marching field, it, it works great. Um, of course, you have to be very delicate. It's a very, um, you know, precious thing. And, and you know, I, I highly recommend being cautious, taking one of these out on the field. 
Um, but that being said, there's plenty of professional drum corps that march a full line of 180s on the field um, and collegiate marching bands as well. You know, it just it really projects incredibly well. So it's it's a it's it would be a, a great horn on the marching field as long as you're careful with it. <laughs> yeah, my rule, yeah, my rule of thumb was always I would practice with my student horn and whenever it was competition time or Friday night when we're playing under the lights, that's when you bring out the Strad and really uh, let it run. There you go. <laughs> Good call. Last thing you want is this thing, you know, sitting in the stands and somebody stepping on it. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the, the one of the variations. Uh, you know, as Steve mentioned, there, there are a lot of variations, um, but th this is one of the first steps, you know, to look into you know, and it may be something that a few of you out there are, are interested in, in trying. Um, it, you know, it's it's definitely a, a different approach. Um, so the that long number at the top, it's an LR 180S37. So the only difference here is the LR. Well, what does that mean? Um, it's it's basically a, a lightweight reverse lead pipe. So the lead pipe we talked a little bit about is basically starting right after the receiver and going from here all the way to the main tuning slide. So that pipe right there is your lead pipe. And, you know, lead pipes have a huge effect on the way a horn plays um, and, and the way it feels, especially, um, you know, the bell and the lead pipe, two of the biggest things um, also about pieces. But for, the, for a different feel, um, the reverse lead pipe is basically just f literally flipping it backwards. So it's going to create a little bit more openness at the end, sorry, I got this backward, at the end of the pipe before it meets the slide. So it, it, it's more free blowing. For someone that's got a really strong airflow and just maybe doesn't struggle a whole lot in, in the upper and lower range and they, they just have a lot of power, this might be a great option for you. Um, it does get a little bit of a balance to it with the lightweight body. And we talk about body, it's in more of the, the valve block here. Um, so that lightweight construction, it, it does help the responsiveness of it. So you get a really nice combination, a good balanced feel. Uh, again, this, this, you know, if this is your first um, time stepping up to, to a, a higher level trumpet from a student model, you know, it may not be something that's, you, you know, just a great choice to jump into. I honestly would recommend the standard 25 pipe, uh, which is the 180S37, and, and just starting there, you know, see how that feels for you. And if it plays great, that's how most people will prefer it. You know, some people like this LR and it's, it's a nice option for, for certain players. So we just wanted to make you aware of that. So let's go ahead and move now to the, uh, the 190 series. Uh, the 190 series is, is something very special that's come out <clears throat> excuse me, more recently. And what we really wanted to accomplish with the 190 is how to take that 180 and incorporate some of the vintage design elements. Um, the great thing about Bach trumpets is that we've really held on to the original design aspects um, and, and try to really keep the integrity of the, the original sound concept alive especially in the bell manufacturing and in, in the way we design and, and make our trumpets. Um, but there's been a few things along the road that have, have changed slightly. And the 190 is taking us back into some of the more early approaches. And one of the cool things is that it, it does use the same bell. It is a 37 bell. So this is the 190 here. Um, you could see it. Wow, it looks just like the other one, right? It, it really does. I mean, it's it's kind of got a, I don't know if you can see this a little bit more, probably not in the glare, a little bit more fancy engraving on it. Um, and it, this came out as the uh, the 50th anniversary of Bach being in Elkhart. Uh, if you didn't know, Bach originally started in, in New York um, at a tiny little shop uh, in New York City and, and, and went to the Bronx and then moved over to uh, Mount Vernon. And then um, it's been, wow, 60 plus years that it's been in Elkhart. So quite a long time. And here's what's special and different about the 190. Uh, one of the big things is the valve construction. So when we look at this, what we call the valve block, basically this, this whole section right in here where the valves are. Um, 
originally, these were two separate parts, the top and the bottom, right? The baluster is the top part there. And that was because they couldn't really make it in one piece because it's hard to cut the little slit that goes for the valve guide to go up and down. Um, but then, you know, years ago, when the advent of CNC machines came about, we were able to start making this in one piece, which is a, a great advancement and really, really cool process. And that's the way 180s were made for many, many years. And it's really become the standard for, for a long time. And after a while, people started to wonder, you know, there's there's something about some of those old Elkhart box that just feels a little different. We're not really sure what it is. Well, that was a big part of it is a two piece valve block. So the 190 went back to that two piece construction. Now, what does that do for the sound? You know, it's it's for somebody picking up, uh, you know, a professional model trumpet for the first time, they're not gonna feel a huge difference perhaps. Some people may, but you know, for a really discerning artist or somebody advancing player, you know, you're gonna feel a little bit more resonance coming through the horn. There's a different type of vibration. I think part of it is because your hand is right here. You really feel that vibration and it carries through the trumpet. Uh, it really helps the responsiveness of the horn too. So it just kind of elevates that amazing sound and characteristics of the 180 into another level. Uh, the other really cool thing about the 190 is the way we mount the bell. So the way we position the bell onto these Z braces here. So the bell, every bell has a seam. You saw in that video where the, the, the brass comes together and they have to seal that seam. We call that brazing. Now, usually that seam is, is on the bottom of the bell, but on this 90, we actually put it on the side. So the seam, see if I can get a good angle here. So the seam of the bell is actually right where these feet of the braces touch. And what that does is, you know, kind of just helps to, to lock in the connection point on the seam itself. So the rest of the bell is very free to vibrate. It just helps with that resonance, that, that pure sound vibration. So a lot of this is, is really important about you know, a, a really a vibrant sound quality. And the really uh, last important part of this model is that we use a different bead wire. Now the bell wire or bead wire is what goes around in this bead here. You can kind of see a lip. And now inside of this little lip is actually a wire. And that, that wire goes in every Bach trumpet we make and every professional Bach trumpet. And we use different styles of wire. Some of them are brass wires. Some of them are steel. Some of them are more rounded. Some of them are a little flat. <coughs> and this one uses a, a, a steel wire. And what that does is really helps the projection. So the cool thing about the 190 is you get a lot of resonance. It's very responsive, flexible. And, and the response, it, the sound just jumps out of the bell. So if you're looking for a horn that has... Um, more superior sound even than a 180 this is your solution right here it's a fabulous fabulous horn so it's it's, it's been a really welcomed addition to the the bach trumpet line and it's yeah it's very popular. yeah jason great question in from somebody that uh i personally know uh, mr gaffney in greensboro north carolina he's actually one of our trumpet teachers but he and i were talking shop not too long ago and and he was bragging on the uh the mount vernon bot that he's got 1954 uh large bore and he's curious one of his questions is um does uh does his horn the mount vernon large bore have any of the design elements of the 190 s 37 and i, I mean i know that the two-piece uh, valve construction is one of them but are there any others yeah i mean those those three things that I really mentioned are, are the key components that that take the 190 back to the, the Mount Vernon era. You know, a lot of people have really sought out the vintage horns. I mean, it's a great thing about Bach trumpets is, is that they, you know, first and foremost, they they last a long time because they're built incredibly well with, with very durable materials and and you know, they hold their value, which is a really important thing. In fact, uh, they actually increase in value sometimes um, when they're taken 
care of well. It's kind of like a, a Steinway piano, one of the few investments of, a, of an instrument that increases value over time. You know, a, a, a vintage Bach trumpet is, is much in that vein. And, but the cool thing about the 190 is that we went back to some of those early design elements. So it's, it's some of those simple things that, that take us back. No, nothing else has really changed. You know, we're still using the same materials, the same construction methods to make the bell. Um, but but the way we mount that bell on the steam is really important. The two piece valve block is huge. The steel wire is also a big thing there. So trying to compare it with, with the vintage elk cart, it, it really has, has brought back some of that feeling that people get when they say, man, you know, something's a little different, not that it's bad or good, it's just a little different um, from the 180 uh, compared, you know, in the last 40 years to something that was made, let's say, 60 or 70 years ago in, uh, in, in uh, Mount Vernon, then that's, that's really what that difference is, is some of those little things. Love it. Yeah, um, also have another good question. I honestly don't know the answer to this. Um, got a gentleman that's been playing um, for some time. He just picked up the horn in June of this year after not having played for about 50 years. Uh, he upgraded to the LT-180S. Um, it's the 43. And uh, I, I guess there are, there are some concerns with centering the pitch and there's uh, another manufacturer that has some sort of video to uh, to fix tonal problems. Does does Bach offer anything like that, or would you have any suggestions for him on on how to uh, resolve that? As far as as videos are concerned, um, I can't say that we have anything online in that sense. I mean, the the really the the biggest thing I can recommend if you're struggling with centering certain notes is you know that every player is different you know everyone that picks up one trumpet is going to feel that single trumpet a little differently um and that's that's true from from every level all the way and sometimes even more extreme when you get to the professional level you know professional players are very diverse in the way they they have their embouchure setting their airflow the, the way they approach the horn their sound concept all those things have have variation. So, you know, some players may feel like a horn just slots really well. Every note just feels very centered and easy. Someone else may pick up that very same horn and say, I just can't center anything on this horn. It just feels like it's just not balanced to me. And that's that's totally normal, you know, and we all have to find ways to to to, to dial it in, if you will. And, and that's where I would say, you know, the, the, the important thing is, you know, finding someone that you can rely on, um, like your your local music and arts center, that you can go to and say, okay, you know, maybe I need to try a different lead pipe. Um, you know, maybe I need to try a different tuning slide. You know, we, we do have options of rounded tuning slides, which which definitely alter the feel um, and the, the resistance there. But, but the lead pipes are especially something that, that can change the feeling of the resistance. And that alone can, can drastically change the way you center your notes. Um, and I, I, you know, I could say, if you're looking for kind of a, you know, a tutorial on that, I, I wish I could point you to a specific link or something right here, but, you know, I, I know there's stuff out there online and, you know, in fact, you know, with, 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 you know, Monet, as you mentioned, has stuff on their site. It's, you know, you can apply some of that that to, to any trumpet, really. So just looking at ways to to experiment. And I can't say that there's one fix for every problem, you know, that, that comes about because one person's problem could be fixed one way. That same problem could be fixed a totally different way by somebody else. So it really takes a little bit of, of, of exploration. You know, you have to you have to really get out there and try a few things. And then sometimes it's a really simple change, you know, as, as much as just changing the lead pipe out. Uh, and those are things that can be done. You know, we sell lead pipes and, and you know, music and arts can absolutely get those and their technicians are, are fantastic. So getting those things swapped out for a player is, is not really a, a huge deal. It, it, it can be done pretty easily. So, 
And that would be my recommendation. Yeah, great answer. I, you know, um, it's something that I've struggled with. I mean, I went to school for trumpet performance and it, my entire career, I struggled, um, you know, with, with coming up with the perfect combination. I mean, one, you know, one month it would be exactly like I want it. And then the next month it's not, um, and, you know, so for those advancing players and those, uh, the players that have already stepped up at this point, you know, it's, um, uh, it's important to consider, you know, other mouthpiece options. There's obviously lead pipe options. I ended up um, with a tuning slide uh, with the Amati water key and that's rounded as opposed to the D, you know, you'll eventually get to the point where you've got it dialed. Uh, another great question that just came in, uh, and I know that this has to be on many folks' minds um, that are either here with us tonight or they're gonna watch this uh, down the road um, uh, I'm interested in having my son step up, but in the COVID climate, not as comfortable with my son trying several trumpet, trumpets. Uh, how can I help him decide what's right for him without having to try so many? So essentially, you know, how do I make my decision? Um, you know, where do I go from here if I don't want to walk into a music store and try 13? Uh, I want to pick the horn and I want to buy it at, at the local music and arts. How, how would you, what would you recommend? I think if it's okay, I'll take that one, Steve. Um, that's a great question. And I know that that's on everybody's mind today. Um, and I, what I would say is go through the same process as you normally would. You know, we don't have the, the same luxury of being able to just walk into all these public places and doing all the same things in the same way, but you can still do the same things just in a modified way. So, um, you know, you can have, you can seek the same counsel. So for example, if you have a great relationship um, with your music, local music and arts store, you can still have that phone conversation. They can, you can, they can still ask you the same types of questions to get you to the right fit um, with that with that particular player. I also think, frankly, that's part of the reason why uh, in partnership with uh, Woodman Brass Women and Music and Arts, we're doing sessions like this together is because I think that um, they as a company have a lot of faith in, in us as a manufacturer. And so we're trying to present you today with some really good options that we think are really universally well accepted in the industry um, so that you can try something like this. And the one thing that I will say in working really closely with music and arts for many, many years, um, one thing about um, music and arts I really like is that they've always had a very flexible return and exchange policy. And I'm sure that, you know, in this type of an environment, that's a really critical way that you can kind of feel more comfortable um, taking a bit of a leap of faith, you know, uh, getting a, a 180S37 because you have a really good idea that that's going to be a, a good fit. But then if for some reason it's not a good fit, they'll still have that flexibility and you didn't even have to go into the store to actually try it out for the first time. Love it. Totally agree. Uh, another great question that just came in, and sorry if I'm uh, cutting it short, Jason, and moving straight to the questions, um, but uh, we've got somebody that's got a 35-year-old box, 37 Bell, um, and he's curious about how to tell what the model number is and, and trying to identify that horn. So um, I, I have a thought, but I'll turn it over to you first to... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it, it's it can be a little tricky um, because you know where where do you find those identification marks? You know, of course, the bell, the number of the bell is on the bell itself. Um, the only other marking you might find there is if it's a lightweight bell. A lightweight bell is basically a little bit thinner material. Uh, there there will be a little star on the bell, uh, and you'll notice that's the, the lightweight bell. Um, now, the other key feature is, is, is on the valve block itself. You can see the bore size is always, this is a medium large bore. So we know that that's marked there. Um, now, obviously this is the 190 series and, and we still have the anniversary marking on that. Uh, you can't quite get a good picture there with the glare, but that's on there as well. And then as far as the lead pipe, You'll often see um, if there's a, a different lead pipe on there, you'll see the stamp of that. If it's an LR, you might see the 25 LR. Um, or if it's a, let's say a number seven or a number six lead pipe, you, you'll see that stamps on the lead pipe itself. If you don't see anything on there, it's most likely a standard 25 lead pipe. Um, and same thing, you'll, you'll have the medium large bore stamp on the valve case. 
So most likely it's a 180 S37. I don't know if you got anything to add to that, Steve. Yeah, I, uh, you know, whenever you're trying, I know that there is, uh, there are some websites out there and I, I mean, I'm pretty certain it's a con summer website that you can actually just type in the serial number and it'll tell you what it is. Yeah, and depending on the age of the trumpet, um, we do have a number of the shop cards uh, digitized that we're happy to send out to, to people that are looking for a, a nice artifact to, to see a copy of their, their trumpet. Um, now, it, I wanna say we have up to the 26,000 serial numbers. So if, if you have anything above that, it's not been digitized yet. Um, but it, prior to those 26,000 numbers, you know, we have the actual shop card, which is kind of a cool thing. You can see, you know, the, the, the original handwritten card. It's, it's basically a little in pink or maybe blue index card that shows you the model number, which bell, um, mandrel and which lead pipe, you know, what, what, uh, what weight or uh, was on the bell. You can also see the bore size, of course. Um, and then you can see the exact date that that trumpet was sold. And oftentimes which dealer or artist the, uh, the, the trumpet was sold to. In fact, uh, you know, looking through some of those historic shop cards, I've seen some really, uh, in, really incredible names pop up uh, over the years so for you trumpet players of course you know more modern ones i've seen in the catalogs phil smith obviously his first box strad he bought um and going way back to some other people like uh bix beater back you know this is really cool to see that kind of stuff bud herseth of course um is really neat to see you know that this trumpet was made for bud that's it's it's cool to get that historical perspective you know yeah one of the best trumpet players of all time. Yeah. Uh, one other quick question from the group, and we'll start to wrap it up. Um, uh, I actually have just one or two for you and Jeremy as well, and uh, and we'll we'll close up shop for the night. But um, uh, Virginia asked also a really good question: Is there tutoring involved? Uh, is there tutoring available at our music stores? I'll take this one. I mean, uh, you know, our, uh, we have we have trumpet teachers in in many of our stores at Music and Arts. Um, uh, they are degreed. Um, we do background checks on all of our teachers. Uh, and, uh, you know, the customized curriculum that we offer is invaluable. Um, I started taking lessons as soon as I got my box strat, ironically, in eighth, ninth grade. Um, and it's the reason that I'm sitting here doing what I'm doing today. Um, you know, 30 minute lessons to start with. And then I moved on pretty quickly into one hour lessons. And, uh, um, it makes all the difference in the world uh, and being able to progress in the craft and, and actually have fun. You know, it's a, it can be a really frustrating experience to sit behind a horn and not really have any direction, not have anybody showing you what, what you're doing wrong uh, and then put you on that path of actually working on some things that'll improve the skill, not just playing the band music, but uh, actually playing some of the method books and working on your tone quality and working on articulation and range and so on. So, um, you know, it's certainly something that we recommend. Um, right now, we've got a promotion um, going in all of our stores that uh, you buy three lessons, you get one free. Um, and, um, you know, uh, my recommendation, Virginia, would be to pick up the phone and call, uh, call, call your local store and we'll get you set up. Uh, we have online lessons and in-store. Um, cool. So Jason, Jeremy, I'm going to uh, wrap it up with just one last question. Uh, and this is a me question. I think that it would benefit many, um, you know, upgraded accessories whenever you make this sort of investment in an instrument um, and make this investment into, you know, the future of uh, a trumpet player. Uh, there's some other things that you need to, to go along with it. Um, you know, one thing that sticks out to me that I know that I've personally had experience with are, are mouthpieces. I probably own two dozen, you know, playing around with different mouthpieces. And ironically, uh, almost all of them are Bach mouthpieces, but different cup size and different rims. Um, how would you recommend approaching uh, that process of selecting a mouthpiece, number one? And then number two, are there any other accessories that you would recommend that are upgraded things that could go along with your, your box strap? You know, maybe I'll let 
Jason speak to the mouthpiece demo aspect of it, but I would definitely say that um, to keep in mind that there absolutely are other accessories that you're going to want to consider. So, um, you know, just as we were kind of speaking about the difference between a student level instrument being built for durability and this one being built for sound quality, you got to make sure that you're really taking care of that investment. Uh, and there is a, a, you know, a bit of um, structured maintenance that goes along with owning an instrument like that. So things like um, the, using the best possible oils. And there's a lot of controversy on what the best possible oils are. Are they synthetic? Are they non-synthetic? And I think that's probably a different discussion for a different Zoom meeting. Um, but I will say, you know, it's now is the time to make sure that you're using the best possible oils. Um, if you have a silver finish, for example, you're going to have to be polishing silver for the first time. You know, you've never had to polish silver. So there's a whole different cloth mechanism that goes into that that has silver um, uh, silver polish embedded in it. And, you know, um, music and art sells some great care kits, um, accessories like that that have all the corresponding brushes for all the different parts of, uh, of the instrument for the mouthpiece, et cetera. I think that it's really time to make sure that you're um, refreshing any of those basic functional uh, cleaning supplies. But I'd also re uh, recommend something like in, in an instrument stand. If you don't own a trumpet stand today, you should certainly get one when you get an instrument like this for a couple of reasons. Number one is, you know, an instrument stand, if you have a station in your room, for example, and your instruments on your uh, instrument stand, if it's already assembled, ready to go, ready to play, you're actually going to practice more often. It's, it is statistically proven that you practice more when the instrument is looking at you saying, play me. You know, but another part of it is that um, these instruments shouldn't hit the floor by accident. And so having an instrument uh, stand is going to ensure that there's a proper place um, for non playing position, you know, and that isn't necessarily just sitting on your lap or on a bed or, you know, wherever or on a table somewhere they, there is a proper place for it to go to ensure that, um, that the instrument stays uh, protected and I just want to tag one thing that Steve said, I would also recommend that if you're not already taking private instruction that you do so. Um, private music instruction is one of the best ways to advance, advance yourself as a player. And if you're making the investment into this level of instrument, you absolutely should have that type of one-on-one uh, -on -one instruction. That, that I couldn't agree with more. Uh, both of you guys nailed it on the head. You know, if, if you have a child that is, you know, showing any sign of interest or, or, or you think, man, they, they, they seem to be doing a good job. Um, you don't hesitate to seek out instruction. You know, the, this is one of those things where you, you can only go so far on your own. You know, there are of course some people that, that learn to figure it out eventually, but you know, you're gonna save countless hours uh, and, and a lot of wasted time and frustration. Um, whereas if you go see a teacher, uh, a good teacher that they can show you a quicker path. Uh, you're going to accelerate a lot faster and, and that, you know, retention is going to be a much higher rate. So I can't recommend that enough. Um, going back to the accessory thing with, with mouthpieces, you know, that's a probably a whole nother Zoom session we could get into, <laughs> especially for trumpet players. Um, now, uh, you know, mouthpieces, it's a really personal thing. You know, a lot of people have different preferences um, and, and do all sorts of different variations of, of, of mouthpieces. My, my biggest recommendation is to start with something that's very standard. You know, if you're going up to a 5C or maybe going up to a 3C, something like that, and really set yourself up for, for, for you know, home base. You know, I mentioned that with the 180S37. You know that the, that model. It's the same thing on a mouthpiece. You know, try something that's very standard. And if you already play that, and you're looking for something different, you can experiment with different cup sizes, uh, different backboards and throats. You know, there's so many options out there that you can play around with and, and Bach mouthpieces. It's it's incredible. And if you really want to get adventurous, you can even customize your own Bach mouthpiece to do various sizes that aren't standard. Um, I, I think there's plenty of standard options to choose from um, to, to go the custom route. But, you know, and the cool thing is, is those are the kind of things that are fairly easy to try. Um, and, and, you know, 
the great thing about music and arts is they can, you know, help help uh, facilitate that for you. Uh, and it's it's a pretty easy thing to sanitize a mouthpiece if you're worried about that kind of stuff, you know, and, and trying things out. So experiment, yes, but not before you really have a firm foundation. Don't ever expect a mouthpiece to solve an issue for you. You know, that that's a huge mistake that a lot of players get into uh, as they start to get a little better and they find themselves struggling with certain aspects like high range um, or volume and, or control or flexibility. You know, they think a mouthpiece is going to fix those, those issues. Uh, and oftentimes they might facilitate a certain aspect for you, um, but it may cause problems in other areas that you're not aware of. And, and it, in the end, will be a bigger struggle than just taking the time to figure it out. You know, it's a long process. You know, there's a lot to learn about playing any instrument, uh, especially a trumpet, you know, and, and the way your embouchure forms on a mouthpiece uh, can be very unique. So really get set up on something that's that's basic and, and, and um, standard, if you will. And then when you find that roadblock hitting eventually, it's, it could be time to experiment. Or if you're looking for a different option or a different sound quality that you just can't get on the mouthpiece you use, then it's time to try some things out. Yeah. One thing, uh, thanks, Jason. I, one thing I've learned in this, in my career of trumpet playing is don't overcomplicate it. I overcomplicated it and always ended up back at the least complicated thing. Um, you know, I used to tell my trumpet students, um, especially those that are in high school, going into college, uh, all you need is a 3C trumpet mouthpiece and a 180S37 uh, standard, um, and, and you will be just fine. Don't overcomplicate this process. Uh, get you a horn. So uh, really appreciate <laughs> it, guys. Uh, really, really appreciate it. I'd just like to thank both of you, Jeremy and Jason, for joining the, the product showcase about Bach trumpets. Um, I think that everybody would agree that these instruments are among the top trumpets uh, on the market today and, and an excellent choice for many levels of players. Um, during the Upgrade Your Sound Showcase, we have several special offers available in store. 48-month um, financing. Uh, this is the first time that we've ever been able to offer 48-month financing. You can get this, uh, the special deal, the special financing at Music and Arts um, at, at any of our retail stores, uh, or we're also offering the financing online with our partner Woodwind and Brasswind. I'm sure that many of you have heard of them. Uh, you will receive a follow-up email at, uh, with all of the details, or you can just go directly to the uh, woodwindbrasswind.com. Uh, and then the second piece of this really exciting offer um, you can either choose the financing or you can take uh, just a cash price, uh, which is 15% off instruments, $75 or more. So obviously uh, the box Stradivarius line would, would be applicable on that. Uh, and we'd love the opportunity to help you in our stores. Uh, if you've got any more questions, uh, the showcase extends uh, in store this weekend where you can visit your local music and arts. Um, all of our uh, associates in our stores uh, are experts and they, they understand, um, you know, how everything works and, and, and be glad to take care of you. Uh, we also have some uh, incredibly, again, talented trumpet teachers in our stores right now through Christmas Eve. Uh, we've got a promotion of buy three lessons, get one free. So please stop our stores. Uh, we appreciate your time tonight. Uh, and thank you again for joining the uh, instrument showcase about Bach trumpets. Everybody has a great evening and we will Talk to you soon.